Welcome back to our Chapter 6 video on memory. When we left off, we were talking about sensory memory and short-term memory, the first points of access to the information we want to use, to retrieve, to encode. And now we're going to look at that actual information storehouse called long-term memory. As far as most psychologists and neurologists can tell, this is a nearly infinite amount of space to store information. If short-term memory has seven bits of possible uh, information or access, some mathematical estimates put this in the quintillions of bits for long-term memory. Regardless of how we quantify it or look at it, long-term memory can hold just about everything we experience. Now there's a lot of different types of memories that you can pull out of this brain of yours. And I'm going to put them into two types or two categories. First is called explicit memories, which your text also calls declarative memories. These are memories, information, sensations. All of this is the information you deliberately retrieve from your long-term memory stores. If I ask you to name all the presidents in order, that's explicit memory. If you tell me about what you did last Saturday, that's explicit memory. If you tell me the days of the week, that's explicit memory. Those are all pieces of information you're having to specifically retrieve. Examples might be episodic memories, those memories that happen directly to us. So when I said what happened to you last week, last weekend, all of the actions and sensations and experiences that you had personally, those are your episodic memories. They're autobiographical. The other example I mentioned was like trivia, knowledge, tell me the days of the week. Those are semantic memories. Again, both of these are examples of explicit or declarative memories. But episodic memories are those only you can experience. You can tell me what you did last weekend, but that's just a fact. Now it's just general knowledge, but I can't truly experience. I don't have those memories. That is episodic memory. Now the other big category is implicit memory, sometimes called non-declarative memory. And these are those memories that we don't intentionally access, that the information, sensations, all of those stimuli that have activated these memory stores, we are not doing it purposefully, at least not typically. For example, if I ask you to throw that ball, if you're a ball player especially, you're going to pick up the ball and you throw it without really thinking about how throwing a ball works. If I ask you, do you use your left thumb or your right thumb to press the letter E when you're texting, most of us can't answer that until we just do it. We just put the phone in my hands and let's see. So there are almost these like automatic memories that show up on occasion. And I'll give you three examples of those. Procedural memories are the habits, the actions, the how to do things. Uh, so if you get in your car, you probably don't spend a lot of time asking yourself, how do cars work? It just sort of happens. You put in the key, you turn it, you use the brake, you use the gas, you use the shifter. It just kind of comes naturally. Well, technically, you are accessing those memories on how to use a car, but you're doing it at an almost subconscious level. The same actually goes for classical conditioning, something that we talked about in the last chapter videos. Remember, classical conditioning is about learned associations, pairing things together. Well, when Pavlov rang the bell, the dogs didn't think to themselves, hey, the bell means food, I like food, I'm going to salivate. Instead, he rang the bell and immediately the salivation happened. Yes, that was the logic process that led the dogs there, but it was an almost subconscious or unconscious reaction. Finally, another good example of implicit memory, one that we'll see again when we come to the next chapter, is priming. Priming is basically activating information that you didn't necessarily mean to or that I can actually make you think of it better. For example, look at the screen. One, two, three, four, blank. So, what goes in the blank? Is there anyone who didn't think five? I didn't think the word pumpkin. I didn't think the number 13, I couldn't help myself but think of the number 5. That's because I was primed by the other information already there. A good example would be a pretty interesting study done by psychologists where they divided students up and had them do word searches. Those where you circle words hidden in letters. 
Now, the students thought they were there for a type of intelligence test, but that was not the case. Half of the students, randomly, had word searches with words like rude, intrude, bluntly. The other group had words hidden in their word search, like polite, cautious, sensitivity. And the real experiment was this. When the student was done and brought the paper to the professor to turn in and leave, the professor would intentionally start a conversation with a fake student, a plant. And that conversation was always to go 10 minutes. So you're waiting to leave, paper in hand, and that professor is busy talking to someone else. In group A, the ones who got words like rude and intrude, 64%, over half of them, interrupted the professor to turn in their assignment. In group B, with words like polite or cautious, 84% of them waited until the assignment was done, well, and specifically until the professor had talked for 10 minutes with the student. So we actually change people's behavior just by having them circling words. That's priming, making those things come to the surface. Now, memories are organized basically through encoded pathways. We learned about a word, schema, which was in uh, our chapter talking about Piaget and how we encode information from our childhood experiences. Schema is that concept, that box that we organize everything that we experience. A script is just a specific schema. Uh, for example, if you walk into a restaurant that you've never been to before, I bet you still know what to do, right? You know that the schema of restaurant has scripts like wait for a table, order a drink, look at the menu, leave a tip, things like that. Now when we talked about neurology in chapter 2, I said that the neural network implies all the neurons are linked, they're talking to each other, organs are communicating to the brain, which is communicating to the other organs. It's this interconnected system. The same goes for memory itself. Uh, we refer to these connections as nodes. And like in my illustration at the bottom there, uh, different memories connect to other memories and they create full pictures of what you are, who you are, what you're thinking about. If I say, think about Crowder College, I bet you don't just think of a building, though that's probably one of the memories. You probably didn't see a picture of a teacher. You think about an assignment you have to do. You think about the money that you owe. or You think about a lot of things and those start interconnecting with one another. We call this long-term potentiation. Long-term potentiation is how strong are those connections so that you can quickly retrieve the information. For example, when I was just a few years ago in college classes, I had to memorize a poem for a class. Okay, Many of us have done things like that. I can't remember the words to that poem. However, I can remember the words to my favorite song. Well, that's a poem too. How come I can remember that? Well. I listen to that song more, it's, I elaborate that song, meaning it's meaningful, it connects to other things. I'm developing long-term potentiation for that information. I've barely accessed the information on that poem I had to memorize, and maybe if I had to learn it all over again, I would learn it a little bit faster, because I would rem remember a few pieces, but that long-term potentiation is quite diminished. I do want you to realize that when we talk about where we keep our stuff, when we say memories or where we keep this information, realize that there's not one small piece of the brain, such as this part of the limbic system is where all our memories are housed. It's not true. That's because your memories, and this is important, are not replays of events. When I say, what did you do yesterday? You don't just hit play like a DVD, and watch the movie in your head. It may seem that way. But memories are reconstructions. Multiple parts of your brain create a new experience for you, trying to replicate the old one. So if I say, tell me about the last movie you saw, or this be more, this be more general, tell me about the last date you went on, where you have to think about the person you're with, the food that you ate, the places that you went to, what you wore. All of those things, you're not just going to hit play and watch that movie of a date. Your brain is going to rebuild that date from scratch. And that's where we start to see those flaws of our memories. Because in memory, if we're always reconstructing every time we access that memory, 
is there a chance we can build it differently than the last time? Maybe we forget a piece and we add a different piece that wasn't there before. The answer is yes, we absolutely do this. And this is one of the weaknesses of memory. So let's look at retrieving information. And first of all, if you do think about, let's say the last movie that you saw, like I said before, you might realize that you remember the beginning of that movie really well. You definitely remember how the movie ended, but the middle bits are kind of hazy. That's called the serial position effect. Basically, whether it's a book, a film, or just any experience that you have, we typically remember the beginnings, we were good at remembering the end, but the middle starts to get fuzzy and jumbled pretty quickly. If you want to be specific, they have names based on their points in time. The primacy effect is the fact that we remember the beginning. The recency effect, as in the word recent, is we're better at remember things at the end. When we compare the two, yeah, we're a little bit better at the end than the beginning, but that kind of makes sense. That's the most recent thing that we experienced. But as you see in this chart of the serial position effect, it's the middle bits that we really start dropping off. Now, in terms of retrieving information from your brain, if I say, hey, remember when you blank, there's basically two types of retrieval. There's recall where you are specifically pulling all the learned information. If I say, I want you to write down an explanation of what you did last weekend, you are recalling that information. You're pulling it from your memory stores. That's very different than recognition, which is also a form of retrieval. If you look at a face or look at a picture and you say, I know I've seen that picture before, that's recognition. You're not really recalling a lot of information about it. All you can tell me is that you've definitely seen it. It's one of the reasons, by the way, why you prefer multiple choice tests, or at least you believe you do. Because you hope that on the test, if you get to a question and you don't know the answer, you can maybe look at those multiple choices and say, well, you know what, that one name, that one guy looks familiar. I recognize him. Maybe that's the answer. Fortunately, I can tell you, it's not always as good as you think it is. Now, of the two, recognition is easier. You know, you'll sometimes hear people say, I'm not good with names, but I'll never forget a face. Well, that's most of us, pretty much. I mean, we're not good at recalling, at least in comparison to recognition. Recognition is something that we're stronger at. But we do overestimate the accuracy of both of those. You know, we claim we've seen someone before. We believe we can describe someone to you. Um, one thing that you see a lot on TVs that, frankly, just isn't as useful a tool in today's world is you'll see TV shows often use police sketches in those police dramas. Rarely are police sketches close to what the person looks like. Here's a picture of a pretty famous murderer uh, you might recognize. Here's his actual picture. Few details missing, as you can see. Also, in retrieving information, it's not always about how well you learned it. Sometimes it's about where did you learn it? Where did you first encode this information? For example, if you are taking a test every day in the same classroom, not every day because you don't do that. Let's say it this way. Let's say you're at an on-ground class, and every day you go to this class, you sit in the same desk. So for several weeks, you're listening to a lecture. You're sitting in the same chair like we do. And now the test comes. If I were to make you move to a different seat in a different part of the room, chances are you would do worse on that test than if I let you stay in the same seat. That's because for weeks and weeks you've been learning about psychology in this example from me while sitting in that chair, at that table, at that angle, and by changing your environment, I may actually hinder your ability to access information. That's why sometimes we bring uh, uh, victims of crimes back to the scene of the crime, helping uh, them to hopefully remember bits and pieces they couldn't until they return to the environment. And certain sights and smells and sounds might jumpstart that brain. Now, there are some memories that we believe we will never forget. Uh, usually they're tragic events, but they're big events that we say, I will never forget where I was, what I was doing. It's just that powerful a memory. And we call that flashbulb memories. Unfortunately, as powerful as those memories are, I'm here to tell you the research is clear. We do misremember them. We alter them. 
we change and create pieces that were not there. I put in an example here, Challenger Shuttle, um, that your book made reference to as well. Um, the idea that we took students who witnessed, in this case, the Challenger Space Shuttle exploding well, was a big national event when it happened. We took students who claimed they would never forget this day and what happened. We had them answer questions about what they were doing when they heard about it. And then just two years later, we brought the students back and had them answer the same questions. Only about 10% of students got their answers right. The majority of people misremembered certain parts and certain details. And even a few of them claimed the stuff they wrote down two years ago was wrong, that they remembered the truth and they would never forget, even though clearly they were misremembering information. Now let's be clear, if a bad thing happens to you, like trauma, it is typically a more powerful memory. I don't want you to think that, you know, being abused is the same as going and seeing a movie. It's not the same. Uh, trauma trauma is, is, or traumatic events are, is typically more powerful, but we are still likely to misremember, to alter, to change information. In one example, half of children interviewed five years after a major crisis, in this case typically abuse, showed that they still made errors, distorted information, messed up timetables. It's just our memory is not a perfect replay. It's about reconstruction. Maybe that's because at the time where the trauma happened, we're not able to focus as well on the details. Maybe it's because if things are traumatic, each time we tell it, we decrease or change bits so that we can tolerate or deal with it more. And though it's a bit controversial, there is some evidence to support that we can actually repress memories, that something can be so traumatic that we lose the ability to access that information. Some psychologists refer to this as motivated forgetting. But again, it doesn't seem to be a long-term phenomenon. If something truly is a traumatic experience, a powerful enough memory, we at least have some access to it. And one last thing on memory retrieval, and that is I want you to realize going back to sensory memory, going back to our perceptions, and certainly going back to this whole concept of reconstruction, you need to realize that your senses are limited and that your memories, by definition, then are limited as well. It does not mean you're not intelligent. It does not mean you're not observant. We must recognize the perceptual flaws because it can lead to very dangerous, unfortunate situations. Uh, we've heard stories about people being misidentified, going to prison, sometimes for decades for stuff they did not do. It's a very real problem, a very real issue, and it boils down to no matter how certain we are of something, our perceptions are limited and our memory is limited. We've done an experiment, or several, but here's one I thought you might find interesting. We filmed a mugging and had it put up on uh, TV, and then we showed them a police lineup and we said, Callers, we want you to call in and identify the person that was in the mugging video to help us make our decision. 1,800 of 2,000 people, the vast majority of callers who called in on this TV program, got the mugger wrong. They picked the wrong person in this police lineup. One out of three people even got their ethnicity, their racial characteristics wrong. So if it was a Caucasian guy, they said Latino, or they said black, or they said something else. All right, and I'm not here to address things like racist individuals or liars. That's a subset, and that's something we can talk about in a different chapter. But even men and women who are absolutely certain they saw what they saw can be incorrect. Look at this white van. Several years ago, there was a man hiding in a car and shooting people with a rifle in Washington, D.C. Naturally, this is a pretty scary idea, a pretty scary event. As police uh, interviewed witnesses at the crime, they, they interviewed witnesses in the area where the crimes happened, they began to get a picture of this white van, the white van that you see here on the screen. A white van that was supposedly at every shooting. And so this white van was put out on Bolo. We were trying to find this car, stopping people who drove cars like this. Well, eventually we did catch the killer. In this case, it was two individuals, brothers, who were shooting strangers with a rifle. Here's the car that they were in. See a difference? Quite a bit. So why the white van? Who knows? Maybe some of the witnesses did see a white van and began to associate, well, vans are typically places you could hide because on TV shows. 
maybe men and women didn't see any cars, but because they wanted to be part of, they felt like they needed to participate. They tried to add details that made sense to their brain at the time. But in this moment, they're also incorrect. So pay attention to your memories, pay attention to your senses, and do realize they're not as perfect as we think. We're going to stop there. When we come back, we're going to talk about reasons why we forget things, and we'll wrap up our little chapter on memories. See you then.